Church. With that, I want to invite Mike Bradley to come on up. Mike has been teaching on Safe Place for the past two weeks, and he brings that sermon series to a close this morning. Would you welcome Mike? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Grace to you and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So we've been talking about what it could mean to be a safe place as an individual or a life together group as we were just looking at and as a congregation the last couple of weeks. I want to say quickly, Debbie and I just this morning, sitting there with our phones on the Wonderful Mercy app, signed up to attend your life together group, Graham. And I heard a word from the Lord. And that word is that those who attend Graham's Life Together group, your favorite football team will win every game the rest of the year. <laughs> Except for the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> who will lose every game the rest of the year even though they have love. <laughs> Well, a uh, quick recap here um, on what it can mean to be a safe place. One thing we've said is it, it's a metaphor. Uh, you're not going to find a, a verse in Scripture, that thus saith the, the Lord a safe place is such and such. But that, that phrase, that metaphor captures what it can mean to learn from the life of Jesus, how to relate to other people so they have the opportunity to be impacted by God's love and by God's power. And we've said that being a safe place is essential to create an atmosphere of freedom in which we can experience God at work. So, so next week, Pastor Graham's going to be teaching on baptism. That's going to be one of the places we discover God is at work in our lives, uh, forming and shaping us to live as healthy and mature disciples. We've noted in the last couple of weeks that just because you and I claim to be a Christian does not mean we're healthy. It doesn't mean we're mature emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. Uh, it does mean that there's nothing that can ever separate us from God's love, but there's still work to be done in our lives by the Lord to grow us relationally, emotionally, and spiritually, to be healthy and, uh, and mature disciples and leaders in the church, and to live lives of effective witness in the world. And that's one thing about being a safe place we want to make sure to mention. It's not something that just happens here in the church. It's as we go be the church in whatever vocation, whatever neighborhood, whatever community we're located. It's when Lindsay goes to work, she is that safe place for coworkers or for those who come, come to the gym, for those she trains. Uh, it's being that safe place through the music we write, like Don, the great music that he writes and has produced. Uh, it's that safe place when Pastor Lee's having a spiritual direction appointment or, or Dave is having a spiritual direction appointment, being that safe place for somebody else. This concept can be applied to so many things in our walk with Christ, by the way. So, for instance, in all seriousness, picking up on Pastor Graham's Life Together group or any of the Life Together groups we have offered and have available this fall here at Wonderful Mercy, there's a safe place component involved. We can make it an unsafe place to hear God. When we read into God's word what we think it says, rather than just letting God's word say what it says, that's unsafe. When we spiritualize our agenda by calling it a prophetic word, that's an unsafe place. Every single one of our Life Together groups involves a safe place component to it. The Alpha Ministry is the epitome of being, at least it's designed to be the epitome of being a safe place. We can talk about being a safe place in terms of our relationship with and our experience of the Holy Spirit. We have a Holy Spirit time here every Sunday, just about every Sunday of every week uh, of every year here at Wonderful Mercy. One of the reasons I think we can do that is because Pastor Graham and Dirk and Lee and Lindsay and others have really worked to train and equip us in what it means to be a safe place for a relationship with the Holy Spirit. They've put healthy boundaries and equipped us in healthy boundaries that can give us the freedom 
to dare to have a Holy Spirit time. There can be Christian churches where, in the name of the Holy Spirit, some really unholy and toxic stuff happens. Because to be unsafe is to spiritualize and justify our misbehavior. That's, that's one way we can be a, actually an unsafe people. So this being a safe place, it, it can be applied to being a parent. It can be applied to being a spouse. It can be applied to being a grandparent. Uh, just think of any aspect of your life, any relationship, being a safe place, this, this concept, this metaphor can have an impact. With that said, let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we want to be able to live life as healthy and dis uh, disciples and leaders in the church. And we do want to live effective lives of witness in the world. So shape and form us, we pray to be a safe place person for others, Christians and not yet Christians alike. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, so, so much to say this morning and bring this close. Oh, one, one other place, by the way, the whole safe place concept can be applied and is really important to be applied, and that's in making it a safe place for dialogue. We live in a culture where it's not safe so often to have a dialogue anymore. The absence of civility, sometimes in the church as well as in the world. And we especially need to create and ask God to help us learn what it means to and empower us to create a safe place to have dialogue about theology. Because even in Christian circles, we can make it a very unsafe place to have an honest theological dialogue. It's one of the things I do appreciate about our congregation. Again, our pastors and our elders have really, and uh, in, in the prayer warriors who pray for our congregation, have had such an impact to make this a safe place to talk theology. So, so next week, Pastor Graham's going to talk a little theology at you. And you might have some questions in the class afterwards, and that class is going to be a safe place where you can dare to ask a question. Well, I've, you know, I've always wondered about baptism, this, that, or the other thing. And Graham will just very lovingly, if you disagree with his opinion, he's going to make it a safe place. He'll just very lovingly tell you, well, you're all wet. <laughs> no, that's not what he's going to say. I'm teasing. Uh, safe place. Let, let me say this. Um, uh, this is a, a really important, it's a process. And it's a process that's going to last now until we see Jesus. We are, ne we are never going to be 100% safe place people this side of heaven because we still struggle with sin and temptation. Jesus, again, we said this the first week, he's the only person who ever is a safe place person for us 100% of the time. He is always trustworthy and dependable. But this process of becoming a safe place person or a family, a couple, a small group or a congregation begins one life, uh, one heart and one life at a time. And most especially in the life and the heart of a leader, whether that's a leader in the church, a leader in a family, a leader in a business, whatever it might be. And many of you might say, well, I'm not a leader and I would challenge that thought that you may have that in some way shape or form you are a leader in your family in your neighborhood in your community in your business as you set a model and set the way but this idea of becoming a safe place because it real often I'll get asked well how do we turn wonderful mercy into a safe place well guess what it begins one heart one life at a time it begins in the heart of pastor Graham it begins in the 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 heart of Lee and of Joni uh, it begins in David's heart and Michael's heart and, and, and especially in Leslie's heart and, and her, her dark, dark heart. <laughs> um, <laughs> in my, I, actually, my dark, dark heart. <laughs> there we got it right. And as God is at work transforming and setting you and I free in our hearts, it gets caught by other people. 
Most often this process, by the way, happens in small incremental steps, not in one big, huge, wow, I had a, a burning bush moment with the Lord, although that can happen. It begins in small incremental steps, and, and God is often at work using different instruments. The norm for the Lord is that he uses word and sacrament. Jesus, the living word, and his written word, the Bible, and the sacraments, baptism and communion. We'll talk about those in a little bit. But he also uses other instruments. For instance, um, uh, going down this list that I have on the screen, he uses prayer. He works through prayer. He works through reading God's word for relationship, not just work product. Receiving the sacraments, confession and absolution, life together relationships with those who are safe place people, habits of grace, silence and solitude, spiritual direction, counseling and therapy, and sovereign God encounters. Well, let's talk about each of these just a little bit. Each of these could be worthy of, of a whole Sunday message of their own, but let's talk a little bit about each one quickly. First of all, scripture, uh, talking about prayer to the Lord, scripture reveals that God does answer prayer. He answers our prayers in his work of shaping and forming us to become more and more of those safe place people for others. And one example of a prayer that we can pray is simply the prayer of King David in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. David prays, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you. Wow, that is pretty courageous. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Now, this is a prayer that I believe God loves to answer way more than we love to pray it. And I believe the reason he loves to answer this prayer for you and I, if we dare to pray this prayer, is because, as we've been told so often in our congregation, but we want to continue to declare this, we want to continue to remember this, that our Father in heaven is a good, good Father who is determined to be good to us. I don't think we can say that enough. I don't think we can underscore that truth enough. We have a good, good Father in heaven, and he is determined to be good to you and I, especially in those moments when we know why he shouldn't be. And because of that, he loves to answer that prayer. If we humble ourselves before him and, and, and say something like, Lord, I really do want to be more of a safe place for my spouse, my friends, my coworkers, uh, whomever it might be that, that you're in relationship with, please show me where I'm not safe. I believe he'll answer that prayer, but he will, he will not answer that prayer to punish you or shame you. He will answer that prayer because he's our good, good father in heaven and he's for us and he's against anything that would harm us or hinder us. So let's pray. Let's dare to pray that prayer of David and then let's listen. And let's watch for how God may answer that prayer for us. Secondly, reading God's word for relationship, not just work product. Jesus, the living word, it works in and through the written word very often and the power of the Holy Spirit to shape and form you and I to be more of that safe place who, like him, is full of grace and truth. However, it's important, I think, to make a distinction between meeting with God in his word for work product versus meeting in there for relationship. Too often, we can tend to approach God's word as, well, I've got to get ready for a sermon. I've got, I've got to get ready to lead a life together group. I've got to get ready to lead a Bible study. I've got to have my morning devotion so I can check it off my list of things to do for the day. Rather, I want to suggest that we approach God's word, we approach Jesus, the living word, and we approach the Bible, the written word, as a meeting place. It's a place where I can go and I can hang out with the Lord and I can get to know him and he can, he can further get to know me and show me who I am even to myself. As we do this, as we approach it as a meeting place, I, I believe we can expect, first of all, to be reminded 
from time to time, maybe often, we are his deeply, deeply, deeply loved daughters and sons of God. You know, there's a, a theology in the church, and, and I think it's true, and I think it's fact, and especially in Lutheran churches, one of the uh, uh, in, in Lutheran churches because of uh, an association that I happen to lead is, is uh, uh, an association of about a thousand Lutheran churches in 16 different countries. So I bump up against Lutheran theology from the time to time. And part of that Lutheran theology, Christian theology actually, is that we are at the same time sinner saint. We struggle with temptation and sin this side of heaven, but we are saints. And it's easy for me, and I think it's easier for a lot of people, to major on the sinner side. We are despicable. We are wretched. Uh, uh, we're, we're terrible. It's harder to believe and to understand the saint's side. We are God's deeply loved daughters and sons. As we come to his word as a meeting place, I think he'll remind us of that time and time again. Uh, as we'll probably experience in Pastor Graham's uh, Life Together group, we'll hear his word of guidance for us and direction and revelation for our lives. We'll receive his gift of being convicted of sin and receive his gift of forgiveness for that sin. All of this and more as we come to God's word for relationship rather than work product alone. Let me uh, go to not the only the next slide. Let's go to that and then we're going to skip one. Go ahead to the next slide, and then one more. Just read this one passage. One of the reasons I, I approach God's word with so much confidence and so much hope is what we're told in Isaiah chapter 55. The rain and snow come down from heaven, the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It's the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish. That, that word will is really important there. It doesn't say it might. I hope it does. It, it will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Martin Luther wrote this. The Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. Let's, let's ask the Lord to stir up a, our, a desire in our hearts, if that desire is not already there, to be men and women of the word. Let's meet regularly with God in his word. The, 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 the most important thing about that is consistency. Not, not the, the, maybe the quality rather than the quantity, so to speak. Wow, I read five chapters in the Bible today. Now, I, I haven't read it for two months since, but, you know, no, let's consistently, let's meet the Lord in his word and let's experience his word laying hold of us. Another instrument that God is at work in our lives to, to shape and form us to be that safe place people we want to be is as we receive the sacraments. The sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, there's something really simple and really refreshing about the fact that the sacraments are really not a whole lot more than a bath and a meal. <laughs> God made it really simple for us. He made it really simple for me. Take a bath and have a meal. And, and in this bath, Pastor Graham's going to talk about it next week. He's going to take us to God's word. There's going to be the class after. We're going to be talking about baptism. And one of the things that we're going to find out in one uh, way, shape, or form is, is the thought that baptism is not merely a symbol. Now, there are some Christian churches that preach and teach that. With all due respect, I disagree with that. I think the Bible says that when when we baptize people in the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, that God is at work, God's active, God's doing something. In, in Romans chapter 6, it says that he's uniting us to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say this is a picture of being united to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And sometimes we'll say, but, but I didn't have anything to do with it. You didn't, and I didn't have a whole lot to do with being born either, did we? But it happened. Something happens for us in baptism. Something happens for us when we come to the Lord's table, as we do so often here at Wonderful Mercy. 
God can be at work, sometimes whether you and I even realize it or not, shaping and forming us to be healthier and more, more mature followers of Jesus as we consistently receive the sacraments in faith. Confession and absolution is another tool that God works. And th this is one I think that, that we as Protestants, we kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater during the Protestant Reformation. Well, we're not going to be Catholic. We're going to get rid of all that Catholic stuff. And we got rid of, although Luther didn't, by the way, we got rid of confession and absolution. And in confession and absolution, God is at work in your life and mine, shaping and forming us to be healthy and more mature followers of Jesus. God's word says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It can be in this confession of sins that an individual, myself, for instance, get to hear and receive forgiveness from God as it's declared through the voice in the life of another. There's something powerful about, about hearing somebody else say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all your sins are forgiven. And it, it can happen here on a, on a uh, Sunday morning up front here. Or it can happen as we go to confession. One of the things I'm encouraging all the pastors in my association, so we've got almost a thousand congregations. We have thousands of pastors, lay and ordained. And I'm asking them this question these days. Who's your pastor? And who's your confessor? Who's your pastor? And who's your confessor? who you can confess that thing that's just hanging on to you, that, that thorn in the flesh that you just can't get rid of. Who is it you can confess that to and you can hear them say, all your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's something powerful about that, something in the Spirit that can break the power of it, whatever it is that's had a hold over you and I. Life together relationships with safe place people is another instrument God uses. And I, I think this is one of the primary instruments he uses. There's just certain things that seem to be easier caught than taught. I, I, I know it's probably hard for you to believe, but, but when I first became a, a Christian, came into an awareness of my faith in Christ as a, a young 20-something Air Force guy uh, back in the day, I was one of the most legalistic people you would ever meet. I, I was discipled by a well-meaning and, and to a great extent a really loving group of Southern Baptists. One of the things I caught from them that wasn't as helpful was a, a little bit of a judgmental attitude. Judging other Christians and judging other denominations. One, one of the things I was taught was don't ever join a mainline denominational church because they're all dead, dry, and of no use to, to God. And I, I was taught, don't ever get involved in anything charismatic, because that's really from the devil. And so what did God do? After I got out of the Air Force, went back home to Omaha, Nebraska, where I was originally from, he sends me a charismatic Lutheran pastor <laughs> to have a conversation in a bookstore I was managing, a Christian bookstore. And, and he comes in, and he, he tells me he's a Lutheran charismatic pastor, and he wants to know if I'll start carrying books. This was back in the 1970s, so there was no internet. There was no Amazon. You actually had to go to a bookstore to get your books. And would, would I start carrying books by, by guys named Kenneth Hagan and Kenneth Copeland and Derek Prince, names some of you may not recognize, but they were all Assembly of God Pentecostal writers. And they wrote about the Holy Spirit. They wrote about healing. They wrote about casting out demons. And I asked this Lutheran charismatic pastor who looked a little bit like Friar Tuck to me. And I asked him, what, I, thought, I thought you said you're Lutheran. And he said, well, I am. And I said, well, what's a Lutheran pastor wanting to do with books about healing and the Holy Spirit and casting out demons? And he said, well, I'm a Lutheran charismatic. And I said out loud to him, you can't be that. I don't know if you knew that, Graham. You can't be that. <laughs> and Pastor Lee, you can't, and Dirk, you especially can't be that. And, 
Anyway, he said, really? And I said, yeah, really. And he said, would you like to talk about that? I said, I'd love to talk about it. He said, uh, do you like coffee? I said, I love coffee. And he said, well, let's start meeting over coffee. Bring your Bible. And I brought my Bible, and we began looking in the Word of God. And the Lord began to open my eyes to the reality and power of the Holy Spirit. And then one day I made the mistake of asking him, Pastor Al, what's Lutheran? What's that mean? And he said, well, more coffee. And we met for more coffee, and he started taking me to scriptures. Romans 6, Ephesians 2, 8, 8, uh, 2 1 through 4, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 various passages in Galatians. And I said, well, is this what it means to be Lutheran? He said, yeah. And I said, well, this is just good scripture. And he said, well, at its best, the Lutheran church is a, is a church of the word. We're not always at our best. But at our best, we are. And along the way, God confirmed all of this to me because it turned out he had a really cute daughter and I ended up marrying her. He was one of the first safe place people before I even knew that term that I got to hang out with and I caught stuff from him. I've caught stuff from my mentor, Pastor Joe Johnson, for years and years. I've caught stuff from hanging out with the pastors of our church. I've caught stuff from, from David Hammerslag. I've caught stuff from others of you here and you don't even realize it. I have not caught the Packers yet, Sharon, but... <laughs> There are good things about you that I would, I would love to catch. Dr. Larry Crabb writes this about safe place people. What do, we, what do we believe about each other, not only when we're on our best behavior, but when we're irritating and demanding? As I uncover what's bad within me, a safe place friend stays relaxed. He or she sees something else. I know of little else so powerful as confessing wretched failure and having a friend look on you with great delight. The safety necessary to own my badness comes when someone believes that I'm in Christ and that he's in me. Does that sound familiar as we went through the prologue to John for so many weeks? I'm in Christ and he's in me. Then anything can be faced without fear of being discarded. Boy, to have a friend like that, that can give you and I courage to be willing to be appropriately vulnerable appropriately transparent to give voice to it, whatever it is in our life that's weighing us down and holding us captive. We catch stuff by hanging out with other people who are a safe place in our lives. For the sake of time, I'm going to just really scoot through the next few uh, too quickly, but uh, the next one is habits of grace. Uh, historically, these been, have been known as the spiritual disciplines, but some people get hung up on the word discipline hung up in this sense. They think, I've got to work hard in order to be. I've got to do this discipline so that I can be. But one of the things about the habits of grace is that they teach us that we're already fully justified in Jesus Christ, and we don't have to do these disciplines. We don't have to do these habits in order to be, but we do them because we already are. Followers of Jesus don't need to do in order to be loved and to belong. You're already loved and you already belong. You don't have to do in order to be forgiven and accepted. You don't have to do. You don't have to perform. You don't have to, to practice these disciplines of the Spirit to be persons of great value and significance. Rather, followers of Jesus do, we do, because we already are. We're already loved. We already belong. One of the things about a safe place people, by the way, if we catch this from Jesus, is there's not going to be anything about you that's going to scare us away from loving you. Just think about that. The one who knows us the most is never scared away from loving us. We don't have to do in order to be forgiven and accepted. We already are, and we don't have to do in order to be persons of great value. We already are, and we know we've been created on purpose, for a purpose. Now, some of the habits of grace, which would be a great um, sermon series, Life Together group, retreat, whatever it might be, have historically included some things like Bible reading, memorization, and meditation. So Lectio Divina, 
will be one of those historic practices that we'll be looking at on Monday nights for those who attend and all their teams win the rest of their games this year. Uh, prayer and fasting, worship in community, silence and solitude, Sabbath and rest, confession and forgiveness, serving and generosity. These habits of grace are ways that God works in and through the power of the Spirit to shape and form you and I to become healthier, more mature emotionally, relationally, and spiritually, which in turn increases our capacity to be that safe place person. An another tool, one of the habits of grace historically has been spiritual direction, meeting with someone who's called a spiritual director. And th this is a little bit of a misnomer because the person you meet with, uh, for me, it's Pastor Lee, uh, David Hammerslag, also in our congregation, is a trained spiritual director. Danny Mullins, who many of you know, is a trained spiritual director. He or she is not the director. The director is the Holy Spirit. Uh, perhaps, I don't know if this is fair to say, but the, the role that David, uh, uh, Danny, Lee, I think... Uh, 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 Autumn Bruick also is trained in this. Uh, they're the facilitator. As the Holy Spirit's the director, and one, one man, one author has said this about spiritual direction. Uh, he's defined it as help given by one Christian to another, which enables that person to pay attention to God's personal communication to him or her, to respond to this personally, communicating God, uh, commu uh, personally communicating God, to grow in intimacy with God, and to live out the consequences of that relationship. If, if you are not familiar with this historic practice, this habit of grace, uh, give Pastor Lee a call. Give David a call. Have coffee or tea or something with him or email back and forth, and they can tell you a little bit more about it. Perhaps that'll be a habit of grace you decide you want to begin to engage in. Uh, another, I won't go, two others that I won't go into uh, detail at all this morning, uh, counseling and therapy. Sometimes there are issues in our lives that we need help in discovering what the roots are, and it's going to take more than a five-minute prayer up here on Sunday morning. Now, this is good and right what we do in having prayer teams up here. Sometimes there are issues in our life that need this and more, and finding that helpful counselor or, or therapist can really help you explore and go to the root of whatever the stuff on the surface is that you and I might be dealing with. And then there's sovereign God encounters. Sometimes God just does do a burning bush thing with us. And this, this happened for me one year in Chicago, uh, which is a story way too long to tell this morning. But I, I came home to the point that Deb came to me at, at one point. We were living in Rapid City, South Dakota at the time, and asked me, well, what's been going on with you lately? And and I, I wonder, what do you mean? And, and this particular issue that you've struggled with for a long time, I haven't seen that in your life for months. And the only thing we could trace it back to was this encounter that I had with the Lord, the encounter I didn't ask for, the encounter I didn't seek, the encounter to be uh, truthful about, I resisted in the moment. But the Lord just decided, I'm going to do this. And it had an impact on my life. These instruments and more, God can be at work in your life and mine, shaping and forming us to be increasingly that safe place person, that life together group, that congregation we want to be. And I have to underscore, y'all, this is God's work. Don't try to make it your work or my work. Don't try to do more and do, and, and do, don't try to do more and try harder. You will fail. And so will I. But let's avail ourselves of these places where we can meet with and we can be with the Lord and he can work in and through them. So where do we go from here? We go to watch the Packer game. First of all, I know Sharon's saying, come on, Mike, get done. They started at 10 o'clock. So um, where do we go from here? One of the things I'd encourage you is just pray. Just pray and dare to say, Lord, have I, have I been a safe place person for others? Is there any place I've been unsafe? And then just listen and just watch what he says, says to you. As I mentioned, um, being a safe place is never meant to be an end in itself. 
it's meant to provide us with the atmosphere and the relationships through which we can experience God transforming you and I, empowering you and I to live as followers of Jesus that our enemy, the devil, considers to be the dangerous kind. Now, followers of Jesus who live as the dangerous kind refuse to settle for merely being nice and moral church-going people. I, I remember watching the old TV show MASH, and if any of you remember that TV show, and you remember Klinger, crazy corporal Klinger, and, 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 uh, and you remember, uh, oh gosh, uh, Major Frank Burns, and, and Major Margaret Hot Lips Houlihan, and Major Burns one time said to Major Houlihan and to Klinger, it's nice to be nice to the nice. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being nice, unless that's all you and I are. The devil's not afraid of nice and moral people. Followers of Jesus who live as the dangerous kind are known for being followers of Jesus who love others with the outrageous, the scandalous, and the unshakable love of God. What have we been hearing for years here now? Wonderful mercy. Love wins. Love wins. And followers of Jesus who believe this at the root of their being are the dangerous kind. And the dangerous kind are those who long for the Lord. Do whatever you need to do in me so you can do whatever you want to do through me. I don't care what you need to change in me, Lord. I don't care what habits you need to change. I don't care what kind of thinking you need to change. I don't care what memories you need to change. Whatever it is, do it so you can do whatever you do through me. The dangerous kind are those who, as Pastor Graham writes in his book of the same title, the dangerous kind. Michael, you're reading my book. This is a little bit thinner. <laughs> the dangerous kind are those, the enemy, and sometimes other Christians consider us to be dangerous when we are dangerous for and to. We're dangerous for the kingdom of God and to the dominion and the plans of of the evil one. In order to become the dangerous kind, we need a safe place. Amen. Pastor Lee. Thank you so very much, Mike, for those three wonderful messages that we'll uh, ponder and, and take to heart in the coming days. A reminder that uh, we're going to have a couple of teams up here that uh, would love to pray with you, uh, for you, uh, about any or anything that's on your heart. So come and, and take advantage of that. And um, before we leave, let's go with the blessing of God. Please rise. As we go... May we go with the confidence of having been called into the safe place that is a relationship with God. And may we ever, ever be confident that we are loved unconditionally. And so go with that, that in mind and go with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and bring you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.